Hello and welcome to Reportage. This is Danish Bin Nabi. In today's segment of Reportage, I shall have a discussion with Manreet Sodhi Someshwar, the author of a trilogy on partition. The first two parts of this trilogy deals with Lahore and Hyderabad, while the third one deals with Kashmir. This trilogy is a gripping historical fiction which deals with almost every aspect of the partition. This trilogy Lahore, Hyderabad and Kashmir are published by Harper and Collins. Let's listen into the author. Manreet, first congratulations for this trilogy and an amazing three-part series. Now, let Thank me you. begin by simply putting a question across to you. It's about the Mountbatten's. When Mountbatten's, you write in this uh, book, when Mountbatten's visited Kashmir and wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Maharaja, the royal family. But Maharaja, under his capacity, did everything not to meet Mountbatten's. Was it a tactical blunder on part of Maharaja? Had he met him, was had there been a discussion on the future of Kashmir, things would have been different. Well, that's uh, an excellent question, Danish. And you got to have this in the cricketing palace straight off the front foot. I Yes, the book... Uh, essentially begins with a scene where the Mountbatten's, uh, which is uh, uh, Dickie Mountbatten as a Viceroy of India, the last Viceroy and his wife are in Kashmir, in Srinagar, to have a parley, so to say, with uh, Maharaja Hari Singh, who is the Hindu ruler of what is essentially a Muslim-majority state. And by the time uh, the accession of the princely states, which is a 565, which is a large number, the rules have been laid down. Essentially, each of them is free to decide to accede to India or Pakistan or stay independent. Now, Hari Singh seems to be toying with the idea of not giving in to either of India or Pakistan and wondering if he can have an independent status, a bit like a Switzerland, for instance. Um, and Mountbatten feels that he should come to a decision because the geographic um, situation of Kashmir, it's at the crown of India, it will inevitably be the border with what will be the newly formed Pakistan. It also has, uh, is almost touching the frontiers of Russia, of Afghanistan, uh, China is close by. So it will be very vulnerable is the understanding and which is why Dickie Mountbatten wants to get a firm answer. But Maharaja Hari Singh, because he himself hasn't figured out how to resolve this quandary, what he does is he sends the Mountbatten's off on various um, trips to see the beautiful valley and ends up not meeting him at all. In fact, when he promises the Mountbatten's that when they return from their trip to Lidder, he will meet them. But he says that he has stomach cramps and foregoes the meeting. And I think that is a great opportunity loss for the simple reason that if he, if Hari Singh and Mountbatten had been able to sit face to face, they could have evolved maybe some kind of solution. Maybe it would have been, well, okay, let's say we sit down and we have a joint meeting with um, the prime ministers of the, uh, you know, Pakistan, which was to be created, which is Jinnah, or Liaquat Ali Khan, and Prime Minister Nehru in the interim government. But what happens essentially is that everybody is left in a quandary. There is a doubt what is going to happen. And that then starts to translate on the ground. The people don't know. And uh, there are a lot of soldiers who have participated in World War II, certainly, some even in World War I, who are on the ground. And a large number of them happen to be punchies because the British, uh, in their sort of a strategy to brand some races as martial races. For instance, the Punjabis, they considered, the Sikhs especially, and the Punchis, which was largely Punchi Muslims. They were considered as sort of these, um, you know, militant races, martial ready. So we also have a situation where there are a lot of soldiers on ground who still have their weapons with them, who become aware of the situation that, and rumors start to float that Hari Singh is Hindu and therefore the assumption is he'll accede to Hindu India, which starts to lead to violence on the ground. So yes, absolutely. You know, we with this question, we're getting into counterfactual history or speculative history. But I think we can always debate the fact that the situation would definitely have been different if the two had ended up meeting. There is also a passing reference of this mysterious prime minister known as Ram Chandra Kark. 
I just want to quickly ask you about him. Did he actually wanted Kashmir to become part of Pakistan? Because many historical accounts say that he want he had a soft corner for Pakistan. Is it a reality? Because then on the other side of the divide, when you read RSS right wing authors, they portray him in a different manner, in a different light. But when you read the liberal, secular, leftist uh, material on Kashmir, they say he wanted to merge Jammu and Kashmir with Pakistan. What about his personality? What was actually he thinking? Well, to be honest, I wouldn't be able to talk too much about his personality in the sense that I haven't researched into him that much because for me in the narrative, he is a secondary character. But the fact that Kak as prime minister thought that it lay in the interest of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir to accede to Pakistan is absolutely given. It's verified. It is there in the records. Now, we also have to remember that uh, the situation in 1947 versus now, which is 75 years later, is very different. People, a lot of my readers, when I talk to them, tend to assume that the map of India that we see now is the map that the British left to us, which is not true. What the British were doing was they had some states which they governed directly. And then there were the princely states. A British them will decide where they want to go. Now, well, by uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel was the Deputy Prime Minister and the Home Minister. And he figured that that would lead to essential chaos because that is like saying you have this large mass of India, which is sort of pockmarked with somewhere large chunks, somewhere small chunks of princely states. And then you're going to call this whole thing India, but you're not really having to have any governance over them. So the idea was to get them to accede to India because a large number of them, except for two, were Hindu majority. So by the laws of partition, you know, uh, non-Muslims stay within India and Muslims go to Pakistan. And so Wallabai set about the process of doing that. Now, Kak is the prime minister of India. He is looking at the interests of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, we have to remember that Jammu and Kashmir, all its linkages with what we now know as India were via Pakistan. The road network through which the was sent down because Kashmir was a great river center. The, the logs floated down the river in Pakistan now, Neelam River as uh, we call it now, Krishan Ganga. And, you know, all connections of the princely state of Pakistan were via Western Punjab, which would become a part of Pakistan. So Kak couldn't see any strategic reason why Kashmir should stay with India because it was essentially disconnected. It is only when the Kabailis uh, the news of Kabailis entering uh, Kashmir reached Vallabhai Patel is then we hurriedly, he hurriedly put into place a plan to have a, basically, a, it was a dirt track connecting from Pathankot to Jammu, which he got sort of work done upon so that it could be concretized and vehicles could move on it. But I think what we should not do is take time t equal to now to debate what had happened then. Kak is totally acting in the interest of Pakistan. Uh, in This uh, Vallabhai Patel started to build this road. This was uh, September 1947, August 1947. Which which month? October 1947. October the Kabayli, 19. see, yes, barely two months after India's independence and partition, we were in the first Indo-Pak war. And when the news of the Kabailis, uh, because the Kabailis started entering from Muzaffarabad, the news of their sort of, and they were... Uh, indiscriminately violent, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, they didn't care. They were here for loot and their goal was the fertile valley of uh, Kashmir, which was Srinagar. So they were making their way towards that and they were looting on the way. Uh, and when the news of the rampage reached uh, Vallabhai Patel and uh, Prime Minister Nehru, one of the first things was if we, and the Maharaja of course asked for help, he sent urgent summons for help. Now if India has to respond, there are two things it needs to do. It either can fly down uh, resources and one Sikh was flown down, which was the first uh, unit which went. And then we need the road network to work. And that's when Vallabhai sent, you know, basically it was. So what happened is when the news of the Kabailis uh, entering Kashmir through Muzaffarabad started to reach um, in Delhi, 
both Prime Minister Nehru and Deputy Prime Minister Vallabha Patel was figuring what to do when urgent summons came from Hari Singh that he and his kingdom need to be saved. They were in peril because any day the Kabailis could reach the, the doors of the valley. And the Kabailis were aiming to actually celebrate Eid in Srinagar. So with that summons, it became very clear. One, there was news coming of indiscriminate violence. So people, uh, civilians on the ground were being mutilated, violated, killed, their property looted. So action had to be taken. And since the Maharaja had one asked for an urgent summons for help and actually sent a letter of accession to India, saying, now you have to help me because now I'm saying I'm part of India. So there are two routes open to them. One is the uh, road uh, the high road has to be, a uh, network has to be worked on. There is a single road through the thin neck of Patan Court into Jammu. So Vallabhai sends, you know, the army starts to work on that, to metalling and tarring it so vehicles can move, a heavy vehicle. The other is the airstrip in Srinagar. Because the airstrip was used for uh, tourist, uh, you know, airplanes. And now we are thinking we are at war, we need to fly down planes and equipment and soldiers. So that was the other thing which had to be secured. And as you read the narrative, you know, we literally came within hours of losing Srinagar because the Kabailis were at the airstrip. Being a student of history, I must ask you that on the, I guess, on 15th or 16th or 17th of August, Pakistan signs a standstill agreement with Maharaja. But what happened to them? What happened to the Pakistani establishment? What happened to Pakistani political leadership. Why did they then send in the tribals? Was it naive on the Pakistan's part, part to wait for some time and look for the things? What basically prompted them to send the tribals into Kashmir? I think we have to remember that Pakistan was first working with the assumption that Kashmir would come to them, just like Hyderabad, which was the converse of Kashmir, a Hindu majority state princely state ruled by a Muslim Nizam. So the understanding was that Kashmir would go to Pakistan and just as Hyderabad, which sat, as Vallabhai said, in the belly of India, would accede to India. And in fact, there is records, Vallabhai had stated that he was very happy with Kashmir going to Pakistan and Hyderabad staying with India. Now, what happened is that um, Jinnah had an interest in Hyderabad, the princely state, because the Nizam of Hyderabad was the wealthiest man in the world. He had featured on the cover of Time magazine. He was, as I like to say, you know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk combined on steroids. He was that wealthy. And we have to remember that Pakistan was born as a bankrupt nation. It didn't have any money. So it would help Jinnah and his new country if the money bags of Nizam could come to his aid. So what Jinnah was doing all through the negotiations that the Nizam was having with uh, Indian government, with Delhi, Jinnah was sort of prodding and probing and keeping some fires alive in the Nizam's mind that it was possible he could accede to Pakistan. So that was a game being played, which really altered Vallabhai's thinking because he, he was, his determination then that, you know, we sort of, very simply do Kashmir to Pakistan and Hyderabad with us, started to alter because there was a lot of violence happening in Hyderabad. And Pakistan, we have to remember, when it signed the Stancil Agreement, Hari Singh again is sitting sort of on, on an edge. He, he signed a standstill with Pakistan. He wanted to sign a standstill with India, but the Indian government said, look, you have to ascertain the, uh, what your people think. That is the ordinary Kashmiris. What do they think? Do they want to be with Pakistan? Do they want to be India? And Maharaja Hari Singh, so they gave him time to figure that out. But Hari Singh is just vacillating. He is a bit like, you know, when we say in ostrich, you shut your eyes and you assume things will pass. He was in that phase. Meanwhile, as we say, Garmahat is Pakistan because the average Pakistani and certainly the establishment, the army, uh, we are saying, why is Kashmir not coming to us? We were promised Kashmir, we should get Kashmir. So, in all these sensitivities, we have to remember Pakistan doesn't want to go to war with India. One, it doesn't. Uh, we have to also remember that both armies, India and Pakistan, the chiefs in both were English. So you go to war, you have two Englishmen fighting each other. And the British were very clear that we are not going to allow this to happen. 
So pulling out the option of sort of war is one reason. And also, violence so chaos occurred. So, so yeah. we also have to remember that uh, the the issue of Hyderabad and Kashmir is happening in simultaneously. It's in parallel lines. I have written two separate books because you know it's difficult for the human brain to contain these vast timelines and characters. But we have to remember that for all the political players, which is um, Sardar Patel, Pandit Nehru, Mountbatten, Jinnah, Liaquat, these two things are happening in parallel. So what I'm saying is that the actions in Hyderabad are impacting the thinking of what is going to happen in Kashmir. How do we deal with Kashmir? Now, Kashmir has signed a standstill agreement with Pakistan. It has still not signed a standstill agreement with India because the Indian government, Indian leadership says, assess what your public wants, what the ordinary citizens want. Hari Singh doesn't want to do that. He's of the view that he'd sign two standstill agreements and stay in the middle and see where he wants to go. So in the meantime, there is a lot of garmahat in Pakistan that Kashmir is ours. It is supposed to come to us. What is happening? Also, they start to put certain constraints. They put a blockade. As I said earlier, Kashmir was entirely, the economy was dependent on Western Punjab, which is now with Pakistan. So they start to put blockades to pressurize Hari Singh into acceding to Pakistan. That is not working. And then they feel maybe a non-military option like the Kabailis sending them in will create enough fear and terror in Hari Singh and will also rouse the people who are interested in Pakistan's accession, uh, Kashmir's accession to Pakistan, essentially the military, the soldiers who are disbanded soldiers who will rise to the cause. So, it, barely within two months, by October of 1947, we have the Kabaili start streaming into Kashmir, aided and abetted and advised by some senior members of the Pakistan military. Here is a wonderful story about the royal family leaving the uh, Kashmir fort and moving to Jammu on the advice of Menon. And you have written around there were, I guess, around 47 trucks of uh, the uh, royal family's entourage. Ex briefly explain this to the viewers because this has not been written much about uh, this topic. Briefly explain to the viewers what was this, uh, the uh, jo vaha, ma Maharaja ke palace mein jo chal raha tha, jo halwali jo explain to the viewers how that scene was basically in those last five six uh, hours because i think men and by uh, they started packing you right by five six in the evening and they left fairly at two three a.m in the morning which leaves us with a gap of only five six hours just try to explain to the viewers about these six five six hours the scene okay. of the royal family Okay, so let me first take you take them back to the fact is that the Kabailis have, you know, in their march down from Muzaffarabad, they reach Baramulla. Now, the Baramulla first, is considered... In first, they in Domail uh, destroyed this Yeah, I, I'm, yes, yeah. I'm not going there because, you know, hopefully okay. they will read the book and find out. Yeah, so I'm coming yeah. to Baramulla straight because, uh, and stories of the havoc they have, they have created, the resistance they have put up, have all reached both the Kashmiris and in Delhi. Now, Baramulla, when they reach, Baramulla is considered the gateway to the valley. It's literally where you know then start entering the valley. And at Baramulla, uh, the Kabailis unleash their violence. They loot. They kill a large majority of people. They don't care whether, as I said, what religion they are. And for some reason, and there is a lot of debate, and I go into some of that in in the narrative. They decided to take a break. They halt. And they go to the St. Joseph's mission, which is a, a Catholic mission. Again, they brutalize the nuns, the missionaries there, and they sit down to cook and, you know, sort of, I think, as you would say, chill for some time. They, and I will not go into the why they did it. But because of that, what happens is it, it, it breaks their sl continued onslaught towards Srinagar. For instance, if they hadn't done it, I don't know, we would be talking of a very different story right now because they, they would have reached Srinagar before 
one Sikh of the Indian army would have landed in Srinagar. But here is the moment, therefore. Meanwhile, uh, the Maharaja Hari Singh's, the JNK state forces, his army has not been able to hold up to the Kabailis. They've got routed. And Hari Singh is celebrating the, the Sera Darbar. So this is in a beautiful palace. Uh, there's ballroom dancing happening. Chandeliers are ablaze. This is Hari Parvat Fort in Srinagar. Yes. So they're, they're, they, are, they are having this beautiful celebration and suddenly everything goes dark. They stumble out of the uh, palace. Everything is pitch dark. This is October 25th or October 26th? Uh, if I remember correctly, no, I think it is 24th. I'll have okay. to look up in my book. Yeah. Still 24th. So this is, yeah. yeah. So they, everything goes dark. And people obviously panic and they rush to their places and Hari Singh makes his way back to his own palace. Now, why has everything gone dark? It immediately becomes clear to Hari Singh and his, his cabinet. The Kabailis are literally at the doorstep of Srinagar and have blown apart the generator which supplies electricity to the city. So now they really know they are at peril's door and something and his forces have been routed. So... It is very, very possible that within the next few hours, the Kabailis will be in his palace and they will do the same loot and massacre that they've done elsewhere. And in the meantime, Menon, because he's received the letter of accession, he's shown it to the cabinet, which is uh, Dickie Mountbatten, Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, Sadar Patel, is flying back with Sam Manik show to tell uh, Hari Singh that we have accepted this and you need to move because you're not safe here. So when they have this discussion and Hari Singh realizes that basically he has lost Kash Srinagar, he has lost Kashmir. Uh, and it is entirely because of his vacillation in the run up, you know, not deciding what action to take. So the only thing he has left to do now is to gather all his wealth, his jewels, um, his massive property that he can carry with him and go to Jammu, which is his uh, winter uh, capital. And that is the scene you're talking about where there is this blurred, everybody's hurrying around, panicking, trying to pack things in. And you have to remember, this is a time 75 years back when there was no cell phone, no message. You don't know. You, you could be doing all this and the Kabailis could literally be at the doorstep. There's no way of tracking them. But we know they are coming. And so in this hurry, uh, in, in, in the autumn of uh, 47, they pack their bags. They have these... Uh, large entourage of vehicles, very fancy cars, trucks, vans, and everything is poured together and then they start the march towards Jammu. And when Hari Singh is obviously forlorn, when he reaches Jammu, the first thing he tells his son and his wife is, we have lost, we have lost Kashmir. And he has been silent all through this journey. And yes. also ordering his ADC to shoot me if Menon doesn't come back. Yes. So that is a very, because Hari Singh is finally at a very, very low moment in his life. He has realized that he has two options. If the Kabailis turn up, they will obviously kill everybody, but they will do a lot of heinous things before they do that, most likely. So he tells his ADC, because Menon is still awaited. Menon has to come back with news of what the Indian government has decided. And he says, if Menon is delayed, because let's say the Indian cabinet decides we're not going to, or they're still debating the issue, and the Kabailis are literally at the doorstep, if Menon does not turn up, shoot me in the head. Because he realizes that this is the end. Now comes one of the main players in the entire story, Mr. Sheikh Mahmoud Abdullah. I, when I read all these historical accounts, I just wonder on a thing. Sheikh Abdullah's ideology was an independent Kashmir. He wanted an independent Kashmir. On the other hand, Hari Singh too wanted the same. He, both of them, neither wanted to join India or Pakistan. If their ideology, if their thinking, if their politics was same, why they could not work together for this thing to happen? This is a, as I say, Danish, this is in a sense a question which makes one think that 
things should be obvious they should get a line just because two people think similarly but we have to remember two things one bharat hari singh has ruled kashmir as a king and you know monarchs we should not judge them by the standards of today that's one thing i always tell people you know we live in a world where democracy has become something we take for granted ki every person has a right has a right to vote but 75 years back when it was a time of monarchs there was no such question the monarch was the king was basically the arbiter of your life of your fate unless you were wealthy enough and you know then could decide to parley with him so hari singh has ruled kashmir with iron hand he is in many ways considered a tyrant or a despot and again i i will say people say things about the arm of hyderabad or other kings because that's what kings did you know they ruled um so that's one and we also have to know that sheik abdullah actually rose as a leader of the people in rebellion against maharaja hari singh's atrocities because when you read about uh, first up uh, sheik abdullah's excellent autobiography and you read narratives about uh, maharaja hari singh which his own son karan singh has written and which a karan singh uh, you know he is a character he's called tiger his sir uh, nickname and he's a character as you know in uh, in kashmir when you read the narratives you realize there was a fair amount of oppression and repression of the majority community which was muslims and sheikh abdullah rose in rebellion against the tactics of hari singh's government saying look we are people we deserve a vote we need to have an elected uh, government so remember they may want the same thing but it's only notionally hari singh just basically wants to continue as a maharaja of jammu and kashmir sheikh abdullah wants jammu and kashmir to be an independent state so that the overall well-being and welfare of kashmiris can be raised because kashmir despite its legendary beauty its people lived in dire poverty uh, the artisans of kashmir you know the shawl weavers uh, you know the kashmir uh, the boat owners the, the people who facilitated the tourism they were all very poor there was a huge income inequality and uh, sheikh abdullah's vision was that we need to raise the standard of living of of kashmiris and he thought in his wisdom that it's best not to sort of fight with either of india or pakistan he truly was seeking like a switzerland like uh, situation where we can be neutral and make our state prosper so you see the two are coming from very different uh, angles to the situation my last question because the zoom, this zoom meeting shows me last 8 minutes left so okay. i would, yeah so i would try to wind up this intriguing discussion i had with you so my last question if we look um, on the um, as far as the partition is concerned all the parties on the both sides were responsible at and the very same time no party was responsible it's like here there there and everything is honky isn't honky dory so if every party was responsible and at the very time no party was responsible why are now since not now the process has been started since last many years why is there in present day india why is there this othering of one of the communities one of the societies let me be very frontal and blunt with this why is this othering of muslims going on now why are muslims now being targeted for the things they have not done in the past mm. that's a very a very good question danish and i really wish i had an answer to that but i can tell you one thing i live in uh, the us in new york city so you know i in a sense see what closely enough what is considered the world's oldest democracy and i am an indian and the world's largest democracy and even worldwide in other countries when you see there has been a a rightward slant you know there is sort of a closing down of borders um a desire for more nativism and all these impulses of course come from many things some people say it's a backlash against globalization but you know we don't want to go down the path of why but what is resulting is that 
anybody who wants to hold on to power one of the easiest way is to convince the majority community that the minority is the cause for this because it gives you a reason then to bind together to say oh all of us are under attack from them the other thing as you say and it's very unfortunate because you know as jawaharlal nehru and through the narrative he reiterates that the ones we call muslims are our brothers they have been born here they belong to this land and bapu said the same thing he warned that the mahabharata is really in our blood the idea of brother turning against brother and through the three books i keep the narrative thread of the mahabharata the fact because it is in our blood the fact that brother did turn against brother and bapu was warning that if we go down the path of partition this is going to happen the idea that you look for easy fixes and you blame the other person whereas when you look at historically our connections in a sense if we consider ourselves india as this mass before 1947 india was a concept but it wasn't a nation state a nation state is a very new uh, recent concept before that the land mass of india or hindustan or bharat as we call it was connected to the land mass of certainly the eastern coast of africa and the entire swathe of the large middle east we had trading links the indian ocean region was interconnected and india's linkages india's deep ties with muslims from arabia from the middle east from persia from in fact north africa were through trade and those linkages were very strong there i mean there were people in the entire western coast of india from gujarat to kerala when you go back in history see there were marriages happening there was trade happening arabic was a prominent language spoken on the coast it was a language of trade so like people spoke gujarati and malayalam but they were equally fluent in arabic so when the portuguese first landed they had to learn arabic because they realized that they could not communicate in trading terms unless they knew the language of trade so what i'm trying to say is that politics should politics tries to define the cultural soil of the land but it often fails and we we see cycles as mark twain famously said you know history rhymes the wheel turns we can just hope that the wheel will turn and inshallah times will return where we see each other as what we are we are people of this land we are all together we do we are hopeful and we do hope that we see those better days coming back again uh, manreet let me once again hold this book uh, for the audience so that it reach more people and i hope students and the academicians read it and try to absorb what basically partition has done to sub- subcontinent thank you manreet thank you for talking thank to you. me thank you thank you so much it's been lovely talking to you please subscribe to our channel reportage and press the bell icon to remain updated